Hello, in this video we're exploring Mowing by Robert Frost. I will unpack the poem, analyse its themes, language and structure and provide a line by line summary. Like all the videos I post, they are aimed at those interested in writing and literature. If you're preparing for an assignment or exam, these videos aim to help you understand and appreciate the poem. Before we start, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, it would be great if you would. It costs nothing to subscribe and keeps the channel running. The more people who subscribe, the more videos I can make. And thank you so much for the tremendous support and feedback I've been receiving. I have the poem here, so let's start. There was never a sound beside the wood but one. And that was my long scythe, whispering to the ground. What was it? It whispered. I knew not, well myself. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun. Something perhaps about the lack of sound. And that was why it whispered and did not speak. It was no dream of the gift of idle hours, or easy gold at the hand of fay or elf, anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows. Not without feeble pointed spikes of flowers, pale orchises, and scared a bright green snake. The fact is, the sweetest dream that labour knows my long scythe whispered and left the hay to make. You likely noticed it's a sonnet, a 14 line poem. Mowing is one of the best known poems from Robert Frost's first collection, A Boy's Will, published in 1913. Frost claimed it was his favourite in that collection. At its core, the poem celebrates labour work but it's also about much more the poem begins with the speaker a farmer or farm worker recalling his days mowing a field with an old-fashioned scythe you've likely seen them in history books or films set in the past a hundred years ago they were still in use on farms but less so due to the rise of agricultural machinery the speaker may be retired, and he appears to look back nostalgically, contentedly, at those days of hard sweat inducing labour on the land. His scythe's whispering sound inspires him to imagine what the blade might be whispering, and from there to reflect on the larger meaning and purpose of his work. He rejects fantasies of wealth and comfort in favour of what he calls the truth or the fact, the plain reality of what his work achieves. Here's a line by line analysis and then we'll consider the poem's themes and structure. Lines 1 to three. Mowing begins in a simple setting, a field, and uses concrete imagery, wood, ground, but quickly shifts gear to abstract and philosophical musings. Frost once wrote, a poem begins in delight and ends in wisdom. And this is true of mowing. Frost often begins his poems by describing a simple event, like a man stopping his horse on a snowy evening to watch woods fill with snow, or mending a wall with his neighbour. 
The simple event he describes leads the speaker in these poems to reflect on life and explore themes, the big ideas. We'll examine the themes in mowing later. In lines one to two, the speaker introduces himself as someone who once mowed with a scythe. At the poem's end, we learn that the speaker cut the grass to make hay, livestock feed, implying that he was a farmer or farm worker. The speaker used a long scythe, a curved cutting blade, attached to a long handle and swung with two hands. This requires hard physical labour. When the speaker mowed, he worked in a field beside a wood and the swish of his scythe blade made the only sound within earshot. There was never a sound beside the wood but one. And that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. Notice how the lines are full of soft S and W consonants, mimicking the whispering of the scythe itself. There was never a sound beside the wood but one. And that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. This type of consonants and alliteration will continue throughout mowing, reinforcing the poem's imagery by building sound images in our minds. Using personification, the scythe whispers, makes the scythe seem like a companion, reinforcing the link between the farmer and the scythe. It is as if they are a team, in partnership. The speaker then poses a rhetorical question about the scythe. The speaker's tone is playful. What was it? It whispered. I knew not well myself. In other words, if the blade was whispering through the grass, what was it saying? The speaker confesses that he doesn't know the answer. Notice the poet's use of hyperphora, where the speaker replies to a question he set. It stresses the speaker's inner discussion as he tries to figure out the meaning of his work. The speaker takes this playful conceit an idea, and runs with it, personifying the scythe and imagining what it would be saying if it could speak. As the poem goes on, this conceit becomes a way of discussing the larger meaning of the speaker's work. It reminds us of the numerous thoughts, often fanciful ones, that enter our heads when we are engaged in physical activity. The fact the speaker personifies the scythe implies he is solitary, perhaps lonely, and that work offers him a means to remove himself from his loneliness. Work is the remedy for loneliness. In lines four to six, the speaker speculates about what and why his scythe is whispering. He offers these ideas in lines full of whispery S and W alliteration. Note how sibilance, repetition of S sounds, continues to reinforce the whispering sound. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun Something, perhaps, about the lack of sound. And that was why it whispered and did not speak. The speaker whimsically suggests that, as his scythe swishes through long grass, 
it might be murmuring something about the weather or the surrounding silence. Maybe it's commenting on the heat of the sun or the lack of sound here beside the woods. Maybe it's whispering, in fact, so as not to disturb that silence. We learn the farmer toils on a hot day. However, the heat of the sun likely alludes to a famous song from William Shakespeare's play, Cymbeline. The song begins, Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done. Home art gone and taken thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. Notice that this song is, in part, about work, the worldly task or earthly labour for which one earns wages. But these phrases are metaphorical and the song is really about life as a whole as well as the inevitability of death. This allusion to the Shakespeare song is a clue to Moeing's themes which also concern work. In this way Frost introduces notions of our purpose in life and how we should fill our days fruitfully in a way we will find contentment. Indeed, in art, a scythe is a symbol of death, often seen at Halloween and in medieval images. At this point, we start to realise that the poem is about more than mowing hay. For example, through the allusion to Shakespeare's song and the poem's subject, mowing, Frost introduces the concept of carpe diem, which means seize the day or harvest the day. We'll explore carpe diem later under themes, but for now it is useful to be aware that Frost is reminding us that life is short and that we should fill our hours meaningfully. In lines 7 and 8, as he develops the playful conceit that the scythe is whispering something meaningful, the speaker now claims to know two things it's not saying. The scythe is not whispering a dream of the gift of idle hours, nor is it promising easy gold at the hand of fay or elf. A fay is a fairy, and both fairies and elves, of course, are folktale creatures who are said to provide gifts and offer to help humans. By now, it's clear that the speaker is talking metaphorically about what his work offers or means in a larger sense. By saying that the scythe isn't promising easy wealth or the gift of leisure, he's really saying that his work doesn't promise these types of rewards. The personified scythe, then, functions as a kind of metonym or stand-in for work itself. Whatever dream it seems to offer, as if in a tantalising whisper, is unrelated to wealth. By extension, we learn the speaker himself is not motivated by money and riches. At this point, we also realise that Frost is exploring the concepts of work generally whether we are engaged in physical work, like the poem speaker, or an artist labouring at their creative craft. Frost seems to imply the artist, a poet like Frost, does not labour at their art to seek financial reward. 
it is the creative process, the work, and the product of their work, a novel, a poem, a sculpture, a painting, etc., that matters most. Art for art's sake. Mowing, therefore, mirrors Frost's life at the time he wrote it. When Frost wrote Mowing, his poetry earned him little money or fame. While living in England for a time, his talent was recognised and he published two poetry collections. By contrast, in the USA, he was barely known. The speaker in Mowing seems to enjoy the difficulty of his work. That reference to easy gold is lightly mocking, as if he's making fun of people who want their lives and work to be too easy. He prefers a challenge, and he takes pride in his labour. The speaker's attitude to work mirrors Frost's view, that labour confers dignity and pride on a worker. The speaker is also playful when he references gold, as gold is the colour of the hay he makes. He may not make a fortune, the metal gold, but the gold he makes, the hay, is the fruit of his hard labour, valued by him and by the grateful animals it will feed. Lines 9-10 to 10 contain the turn, or volta. In many sonnets, an important transition, such as a change in tone or the introduction of a new idea, usually occurs around line 9. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows. These soft sounds mimic the whispering of the scythe, as they do throughout the poem, and here might also conjure up the repetitive motion of the scythe as it cuts the grass down into rows. Instead of personifying the scythe here, however, the speaker credits an earnest love with getting the job done. Curiously, he also suggests that, as he mows, he's seeking a kind of truth. What could all this mean? Well, the speaker has just rejected the idea that he's working to gain riches or leisure time, gold or idle hours. In fact, since he's a humble farmer, he's rejected that dream like a fairy tale, like the kind with fays and elves. So, in referring to the truth, here the speaker seems to be acknowledging that the scythe is a scythe. It's not really whispering any promises, it's just cutting down grass. But this simple task is performed with earnest love. And this love must be his love, presumably for the work itself, and maybe also for the beautiful setting, a swale or sunken grassy area. So, putting this all together, the speaker is implying that he does his work with love for its own sake. And if the poem is an allegory about the writer's work, it implies that Frost pursues his art in the same honest way for the love of art and creating art, his poems, and not for riches or leisure. Lines 11 to 12 add a qualification to the speaker's praise of his work. He acknowledges that even as he labours with love, his work has a cost. There's a price to pay. He does not mow the grass down without 
affecting other living things. He cuts down some feeble pointed spikes of flowers, pale orchises, and scares away a bright green snake. Here, the scythe is the instrument of destruction and death. We'll examine this symbol later. However, he seems unperturbed, not bothered about this. It is what it is. It is a fact of life and the consequence of farming, which is cultivating and managing the land. The grass must be mown to provide food for the livestock. Like all great writers, Frost leaves it to us to interpret these lines and form our own opinions. For example, if the poem is an allegory for the poet's work, these details might have symbolic meaning. If so, there are multiple ways to read the symbolism. As the poet lays down lines like rows of grass, for example, he might capture unexpected beauty, gently lay down flowers along with the grass. Or he might corrupt beauty, inadvertently chop down delicate flowers. Art can capture something no longer there. It bestows a sort of immortality by recording them. Here, the poet remembers the orchises, and art preserves their memory. He might chase away some evil, as if scaring the serpent out of the Garden of Eden. In other words, this line may contain a biblical allusion. Frost all but forces the reader to decide on their meaning here. The symbolism is ambiguous in the way that much of the best poetry is, and we'll be examining these interpretations in detail shortly. In the final lines, lines 13 to 14, the sonnet concludes with two lines that are also complete sentences. One is a general abstract statement, and the other is a concrete visual image with metaphorical overtones. The fact is the sweetest dream that labour knows appears paradoxical. How can a dream be factual or fact be based on a dream? But it ties back to line nine. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak. This metaphor comparing fact with a sweet dream implies the speaker is choosing realism, fact and truth over any fantasy or romantic notion of life. The idea that his work will magically make him rich, for example. Regardless, the personification makes clear that the speaker associates the scythe with a certain kind of integrity or realistic outlook. And once the job is finished, there's total quiet. The speaker goes away, leaving the hay to make in the sun. In other words, he leaves the grass to dry into hay for livestock feed. But that quaint colloquial phrasing, left the hay to make, also places the poem's final emphasis on making and takes agency away from the speaker himself. It's the hay, not the farmer, that makes in the end. It's job done, mission accomplished. We can sense his satisfaction. The final line brings the poem full circle with the repetition of the whispering of the scythe. Once again, the poem can be read as a profound allegory about writing or art making. The word poet, as Frost knew, comes from the ancient Greek word for maker. 
But if this closing image is meant to symbolise, say, a finished poem, it's the poem rather than the poet who goes on making it through our interpretation of the poem. The poet, the writer, the artist no longer has ownership of their own artwork. Just as the grass does its own thing, dries into hay, after the farmer departs, a good poem keeps on doing its own thing, affecting readers, long after the poet has turned to other tasks, a testament to the enduring power and influence of art. A good work of art invites the reader, viewer and listener to interpret in their own way. Mowing, therefore, embodies Frost's opinion of what makes for good poetry. Note how line 13 is end-stopped. It reads like an adage, a concise statement, a nugget of wisdom. Line 13 sums up the speaker's opinion, that the truth of work is life's reward. Honest work brings real reward, a reward as sweet as a dream. The speaker mirrors Frost's view. Truth aligns with artistic integrity. The true artist, Frost implies, seeks the truth. However unpalatable, unpleasant those truths may be to the public. Let's examine Moing's major symbols and main themes. The scythe is an important symbol. On the literal level, the speaker's scythe is a farming implement with a handle and curved blade used for cutting grass and reaping crops. But scythes carry some traditional symbolism too. They're associated with harvesting the fruits of one's work in a more general sense. They're also associated with death, as in the traditional figure of the Grim Reaper who carries a scythe or sickle. Here, both meanings are relevant. The speaker's work can be taken as representative of human labour in general and possibly as an allegory or extended metaphor for the writer's work in particular. It's honest, productive and nourishing work. The scythe cuts down grass to make hay, which will feed livestock and keep the farm going. But the scythe also has a destructive side, as lines 10 to 12 make clear. It cuts down delicate flowers as well as grass and scares away the serpent. It's worth noting here that the speaker inadvertently cuts down orcuses, whose name comes from the ancient Greek word for testicles. If this is a deliberate double entendre, it relates to the writer's creative process. Perhaps the orcuses represent the artist's fertile ideas. But these ideas must at some point be cut away, ordered and organised into lines, like the grass in the poem is placed in rows. Ideas are important, but without the structure involved in organising and communicating them, they count for little. Organising is therefore part of the creative process. Organising the poem, the novel, the painting, the score, the tapestry. This is the artist's craft, their work, their labour. So, like the grass, there comes a time when fertile thoughts must be harvested and for Frost, his Fertile thoughts are harvested and set down on lines, the rows of potential hay. The flowers may also be the beautiful lines that have to be cut down, cut out of the poem while it is being written, part of the organising process. Perhaps Frost is saying to create art, 
one must be ruthless. The excess line, the beautiful phrase, if it is not contributing to the piece, to the idea, must be cut down, removed like the orchises. More so for a sonnet like mowing, which must follow a 14 line structure. So mowing is a meditation, an examination of the artistic process. Frost uses words associated with weakness and fear. The orchids are feeble and pale. The snake is scared, perhaps suggesting that the creative process requires bravery. The bravery to cut unnecessary words. Be ruthless in editing and believe in your artistic endeavour. Here a poem, enough to complete it. This view is reinforced by using enjambment. It occurs only in lines 9 and 11, the part that concerns weakness. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows, not without feeble pointed spikes of flowers, pale orchises, and scared a bright green snake. Compared to the more conclusive end stop lines, the enjambed lines, which leave phrases grammatically hanging for a moment, seem a little feeble themselves. The scaring of the snake might symbolise poetry's power to disturb or frighten. Since snakes are traditional symbols of evil, most famously the serpent in the biblical Garden of Eden myth, this moment might also represent poetry's power to chase away evil and injustice. The poet's or artist's work might even make the world a little more like a paradise. Art, or at least good art, should at times have the capacity to shock. As we've seen, the scythe can be an instrument of destruction, cutting down everything in its wake. For these reasons, it is a traditional symbol of death, often carried by the grim reaper who harvests our lives, Therefore, the scythe introduces the concept of carpe diem. Mowing is arguably a carpe diem poem. Carpe diem art considers the brevity, shortness of life, and how we should make the most of our hours. Carpe diem literally means seize the day, but also harvest the day, fitting for a poem about mowing hay. The poem asks profound questions. How should one best fill their days? The speaker believes his hours are best spent working. Then the speaker asks what kind of work and what work offers a person the most satisfaction. For him, it is toil, labour. This is the work that offers him contentment. Work is in our nature, as natural in a human as the grass, the woods, the orchids and the snake. Work may not bring financial rewards, easy gold, but can offer contentment and dignity. It gives the speaker a purpose to provide hay for the animals. And it is honest work that matches the speaker to the real world, the world of nature. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak. Similarly, the artist here, Frost, seeks the truth, the facts about human nature, by grounding his writing in the real world. He writes about concrete events, seemingly trivial, yet these serve to examine profound themes on life, our purpose, and our often conflicted and contradictory nature. Frost asks us 
to consider the relative brevity of our lives and states we ought to fill our limited time in ways that are productive and bring us maximum contentment. Work is his solution. Entwined with this is an exploration of art, truth and realism. Like the farmer's celebration of simple fact over wilder dreams and of work well done over idle wealth implies a preference for realism over romantic and materialistic attitudes. In other words, the speaker, read as a stand-in for the poet, isn't doing his work for money and success. He's doing it for all its own sake and the sake of truth. The poem suggests it is the right attitude for artists to adopt. While Wordsworth might praise dancing daffodils, Frost poetry and truth rest in the mundane, although no less important world of work, mainly in rural settings amid farmers, their families and their everyday activities. Discussing Frost's relationship with the natural world is important to understanding mowing and many of his poems. Although many of Frost's poems use images of nature in various ways and describe various aspects of nature such as trees, flowers, the seasons and landscapes, it is important to understand that nature is not in itself a theme in his poems. He uses ideas and images drawn from the natural world, the landscape or farms and farming to develop and explore his ideas. And mowing is a fine example of this. A popular and enduring image of Frost is that of the farmer poet, but in fact he spent very little of his time on activities connected with farming. During the brief periods in his life when he did farm, he was not particularly successful. He preferred to take long walks, looking at the trees, flowers and wildlife, rather than doing the everyday chores involved. There is no doubt, however, that farms played an important part in his life. I don't mean to suggest he was not familiar with farming and the hard life farmers and their families lived. He grew up surrounded by farms and farming and the land provides a backdrop to many of his poems. Farmers and their families appear often in his poems, like the images of nature. Such characters are used to develop and explore his ideas. The speaker's work puts him in an intimate and even loving relationship with nature. His scythe whispers to the ground, as if sharing thoughts or feelings with the earth itself. He speaks of the earnest love that laid the swale in rows, as if his mowing is not violently chopping down the grass, but tenderly laying it down on the earth. There is a fundamental sweetness to his outdoor work and the poem's attitude toward such work. Using his scythe connects him to nature more than a machine. The physical strain his body endures in mowing is as much natural as the grass he mows. At the same time, the speaker's work disrupts nature to some extent and he acknowledges this as part of his commitment to fact. As he mows the grass he cuts down some pretty flowers, pale orchises and scares away a snake. Though necessary to human farming and thus to humanity's relationship with nature, his work is somewhat disruptive to nature 
as well. It can cause harm or even death to creatures in the surrounding landscape. The poem doesn't present rural life as a paradise free of all problems. However, it does seem to critique or rework the biblical idea of paradise, that is, the Garden of Eden myth. It appears to counter the biblical idea of an inherent tension between nature and humanity. When Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit at the evil serpent's urging, they are expelled from the Garden of Eden, and Adam is cursed to toil on the land forever. In the poem, by contrast, the speaker sees his farm work as a kind of blessing, and actually expels a serpent himself. His life may not be idyllic, but he seems content with his labour and fate. He doesn't seem to share the biblical view of humanity as fallen from and forever at odds with nature and work. Frost stands this idea on its head. Physical labour, he argues, is not a punishment, but rather a blessing. Idleness can cause a person to turn to evil, like the adage that the devil finds work for idle hands. His work scares the snake, the serpent away. Here the devil is likely symbolised with allusion to the Garden of Eden in Genesis. Frost uses the poem to explore more than physical labour, but labour of the mind, for him that of an artist, especially a writer. Frost argues that the artist's creative process is one of labour, albeit of a different kind to the farmer with his scythe. Mowing finds common ground between the farming life and the poet's life. The speaker's mowing is the only sound in the landscape, implying he's having a solitary communion with nature, in the way poets draw on nature for inspiration. Having established a parallel between mowing and art stroke poetry, he extends the parallel in order to evoke his particular worldview as a poet. Specifically, he rejects both Romanticism and Materialism, the dream of the gift of idle hours and of easy gold at the hand of Fay or Elf, in favour of hard-nosed realism, truth and fact. He implies that the truth value of art far outweighs any material value it might have. As part of this realistic outlook, he acknowledges, through symbolism, the costs and flaws of the artist's work. He admits that, while mowing, he cut down some pale beautiful flowers and scared a bright green snake. Similarly, art doesn't just create beauty and nourishment, it can also disturb, frighten and even wound. The poem ends with the word make as in left the hay to make. This word again hints that the poem is about creative making, more broadly and the artist's creative process specifically. The term poet, as I mentioned, comes from the ancient Greek word for maker, as Frost knew. In Frost's rural dialect, leaving hay to make means leaving grass out in the sun to dry into hay. Metaphorically then, leaving the hay to make might mean leaving the poem to do its work once the poet is finished with his. That is, the finished poem goes on making, having an impact on the world, influencing others, etc. Long after it's apparent completion. Robert Frost's mowing is a poem about the labour of love and the love of labour. 
it considers why people labour, what rewards do they seek. After rejecting visions of money and success, the speaker suggests that he does his labour for its own sake, for the fact of a job well done. This kind of humble satisfaction, the poem argues, is the sweetest dream or highest promise that work can offer. Implicit is the speaker's satisfaction by completing his work and supports Frost's view on how work is related to a person's dignity and pride. The poem implies the honest labourer seeks the truth and nothing less. The speaker seems to equate the truth here with the modest ordinary fruits of a job well done. His work emerges from earnest love of the job, the natural setting or both. The word earnest implies sincerity and integrity behind the love. When one is guided by honest love of one's work, according to the speaker, anything more than the truth seems too weak, as a dream. The expected phrasing here would be anything less than the truth, but the speaker is specifically rejecting dreams that are too much, too fantastical, self and grandizing, and so on. Cut grass and hay are the true result of mowing, and that truth is enough. In other words, the poem seems to insist that good work is its own reward. The poem is a loving celebration of labour for its own sake, not for the sake of personal ambition, a comfortable retirement or any other outside goal. Now let's examine poetic devices and figurative language. The poem is written in the first person voice, giving a feeling of intimacy between the speaker and the reader as he shares his thoughts and feelings. Regarding alliteration, Robert Frost was accomplished in matching sound to sense in his poems. It's no surprise then that this poem about sound, a word it mentions twice, contains alliteration that reinforces its meaning. In particular, the poem is full of S and W words throughout. Look at how many crowd the first six lines alone. There was never a sound beside the wood but one, and that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. What was it? It whispered. I knew not well myself. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun. Something perhaps about the lack of sound. And that was why it whispered and did not speak. These soft sibilant S sounds and liquid W sounds mimic the whispering of the scythe itself and are onomatopoeic. In effect, the whole poem takes on the sound of the scythe. Alliterative phrases also appear in lines 10 and 11. To the earnest love that laid the swale in rows, not without feeble pointed spikes of flowers. Here, the repetitive sounds might evoke the scythe's repetitive movement as the speaker mows the grass down. However, there's not always a neat and clear match between alliteration and meaning. More generally, the device gives the poem a pleasing sweetness. C line 13, a calm lyrical quality that fits its celebration of the speaker's quiet work. The use of end stop lines gives the impression of measured thought. The speaker is pondering the meaning of work and its importance. 
the conclusive sound of end stop lines, especially full stop lines, also enhances the poem's celebration of truth and fact. Consider the closing lines. The fact is the sweetest dream that labour knows. My long scythe whispered and left the hay to make. The full stops after nose and make have a strong definitive ring to them, the ring of an accomplished fact. Throughout the poem, the speaker personifies the scythe he uses to mow the grass. This personification begins in lines two to three. And that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. What was it it whispered? I knew not well myself. These lines introduce the conceit that the scythe is whispering, something human-like, something interpretable. The speaker then suggests what the whispering might and might not mean. He suggests, for example, that the whispering might be a kind of comment on the surrounding atmosphere, the heat and lack of sound, but rejects the idea that it might be whispering dreams of idle wealth. Ultimately, he connects the scythe's whispering with a love of truth. Like many Robert Frost poems, mowing works in subtle, indirect ways. For example, it drops hints about its larger meaning through the repetition of key words and phrases. One of these words is sound. Another is whispered, whispering. Often when poets write about sound, they're at least partly writing about poetry, an art form built on sound. Here, the repeated emphasis on the whispering sound of the scythe, as well as on the scythe itself, lines 2 and 14, suggest that Frost might be using this simple mowing tool as a subtle way of talking about his writing. The repetition of dream, line 7 and 13, supports this interpretation. Real world farm implements don't have dreams, nor do they whisper or inspire dreams. But by repeatedly linking the personified scythe with dreams of one kind or another, Frost seems to gesture toward the kind of dreams poetry or art in general can inspire in both the writer and the reader. Put all these repetitions together and the poem seems to be about more than mowing, even though on the surface that's all it discusses. It seems to be about the dreams, aspirations, etc. that whisper in our ears as we go about our work, whether our labour is manual, imaginative or, as in Frost's case, both. The poem contains just one rhetorical question, but it's an important one as it sets up the poem's basic conceit premise. The speaker notices the whispering sound his swinging scythe makes, then playfully asks, what was it it whispered? In other words, if the scythe were talking, what would it be saying? The remainder of the poem will provide tentative answers to this question. The question is not only rhetorical, but symbolic. The speaker knows the personified scythe isn't really saying anything. Rather, wondering what the scythe is whispering is a symbolic way of wondering what his work means or what kind of promise it holds. Think of a whispered, tantalising promise. As a result, the rhetorical question isn't answered in any straightforward sense. But a couple of potential answers are rejected. The scythe isn't whispering about the gift of idle hours or easy gold. 
In other words, this work doesn't hold out the promise of wealth and ease. Then there's a kind of implied answer in lines 9 to 10 and 13. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows. The fact is the sweetest dream that labour knows. It is a figurative way of suggesting the work is its own reward. It promises only the truth of hard, honest labour and the plain fact of what that labour accomplishes. Now, let's examine the poet's structure, including its form, metre and rhyme scheme. Mowing is written in the form of a sonnet and takes as its starting point images of the speaker mowing the grass with a scythe. The use of the first person, I, my, creates a sense of directness and a tone of intimacy, as if the speaker is sharing some important truth with the reader. This sense of an intimate tone is emphasised through the repetition of whispering and whispered. A sonnet is a fitting form as it is associated with love and this is a poem about the love of work, integrity and the truth. Although a sonnet it is a somewhat unconventional one. Like traditional sonnets it has 14 rhyming lines as well as a significant turn or rhetorical shift in line 9, also known as the Volta. Unlike traditional sonnets, it uses a fairly loose essential metre and it doesn't follow any of the standard rhyme schemes associated with the form. The syllable count per line varies, but each line contains five or six stressed accented syllables. Meanwhile, each line has a rhyming pair, but the rhymes don't fall in a predictable order, unlike in, say, the Shakespearean sonnet, where the rhyme scheme is always A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. In other words, the form is a little less than polished. Perhaps appropriate for a poem about mowing an overgrown field. The roughness also has an informal quality that suits the humble, unpretentious setting. Unusually for a sonnet, mowing uses a version of a sensual metre, meaning that the syllable count per line varies. Still, each line contains about the same number of stressed accented syllables. Here every line in the poem contains either five or six strong stresses. Compare lines one to four, for example. There was never a sound beside the wood but one, and that was my long scythe, whispering to the ground. What was it, it whispered, I knew not well myself. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun. A few lines in the poem follow a pattern close to iambic pentameter or iambic hexameter, meaning they have five or six iambic feet, two syllable metrical units with a dadum rhythm. Even in these cases, there's some variation, however. For example, line three above is basically iambic pentameter. Still, it contains a variation in the second and third foot. It, it, is best scanned as a pyrrhic, two unstressed syllables, while whispered is a trochee, meaning it goes da dum. What was it, it, whispered? I knew not well myself. This variation mimics natural speech, where we often stop, start and vary our word stresses. 
Overall, the poem has a pleasing organic rhythm, even if it gets a little rough and untidy here and there. That is the way Frost wrote it, quite deliberately. In that way, it seems aligned with the untidy yet pleasant natural setting. The shaggy swale the farmer is mowing. Although his sex is not mentioned, it is reasonable to assume the speaker is a man. This kind of mowing would typically, though not always, have been considered men's work. He is an everyman. He represents the world of work and labour. The poem was published in 1913 before the advent of modern mechanised lawn mowers. His occupation is never explicitly mentioned, but the fact that he leaves the cut grass to dry into hay, on line 14, suggests that he has livestock to feed. The setting in mowing is a grassy field, specifically a swale or low-lying area. This swale is located beside a wood, and the speaker is mowing on a hot, quiet day. He mentions the heat of the sun and the lack of sound. The poet uses synodoki, the setting to represent all cultivated land. The location name is secondary to the universal themes Frost is exploring. Let's place mowing in its literary context. Mowing appears in Robert Frost's debut volume, A Boy's Will, published in the UK in 1913 and in the United States in 1915. According to Frost, A Boy's Will is highly autobiographical. The poems cover five years in the poet's life in which he retreated from society and later found his way back. The collection's broader themes include humanity's relationship to the natural world, rural life, philosophy and individuality, all of which are themes that Frost would return to again and again throughout his life. Frost himself consistently shied away from associating with any one school of writing. Instead, his work incorporates a variety of traditions and techniques while remaining highly accessible to average readers. By the end of his career, he was the most recognised American poet of his time, having earned four Pulitzer Prizes and a Congressional Gold Medal. Frost wrote diligently of individuals searching for meaning and finding most often in nature some mirror for their situations. His poems tend to highlight ordinary moments in which extraordinary or profound insights occur. Their plain spoken yet often symbolic and ambiguous language allows for multiple interpretations. The road not taken and stopping by woods on a snowy evening, two of his most famous poems are perfect examples. And you will find my analysis of these poems on this channel. Similarly, in mowing, Frost uses nature and rural activity as a backdrop to share his wisdom, that we must cultivate our time and manage it with as much care and tenderness as a farmer cultivates his land. We should make our lives productive and have a purpose, like the mower in the poem has a sense of purpose. It is this purpose that brings him contentment. He is not sidetracked by idle fantasies or dreams of money and wealth. These are as delusory as fairy gifts. Both the farmer and the artist must work with 
and within life's reality and let their hard work reflect the truth. The truth about the natural world and human nature. The mower's toil produces cut grass that will turn to hay. His honest labour will never make him rich but earns him contentment. Similarly, the true artist's work reflects life's truths and, with few exceptions, will not make the artist rich. But, like the mower, their completed artwork brings them contentment and satisfaction. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful and interesting. Please check out my other videos on analysis and creative writing. These include several Robert Frost poems. I'm always adding videos. To be updated when another one lands, please hit the thumbs up icon before you leave. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed, it would be greatly appreciated if you would. It helps me make these videos and helps me make them more frequently. Thank you. Until next time, write well.